Good morning from Brussels, Belgium, European Union. My name is uh, Rudy van Dam, and I have been invited to contribute to this international seminar as chair of the indicator subgroup of the Social Protection Committee, which is an advisory body to the Council of Ministers of Employment and Social Affairs uh, in the European Union. Although I would have preferred to make my contribution there with you in Santiago, I am still very glad to be able to, to have the opportunity to share with you some information on the measurement of poverty and social exclusion in the European Union. A lot can be said on this. But let me swiftly start with my overview. These are the points I want to talk about, and you can see them on the slide. First, I will briefly say something on the legal and political context in the European Union, which is important to understand uh, this issue of measurement of poverty and social exclusion. Then, I will go into the way uh, poverty is conceived and measured in the European Union, I will say something on the data that are used to, uh, for this measurement. I will say something on the indicators which are used and on the monitoring tools. And if time allows, I will briefly say something on the use uh, that is uh, being made of these indicators in the policy process. So let me start with very briefly saying something on the legal and political context of social policies and their monitoring in the European Union. You will be aware that the European Union is a supranational entity in which the Member States have delegated a number of competencies to the EU institutions. However, in the domain of social policy, most competencies have remained at the national level under the principle of subsidiarity. So, social policy is a competence of the Member States. Still, EU Member States have acknowledged that it is necessary to coordinate their social policies. They thought this is necessary because of the economic context, like the internal market, the economic and monetary union, which interacts with social policies but also because the EU is more than an economic entity. It also seeks to enhance the welfare and well-being of its citizens. In that context, the Member States also politically agreed on, a com on common social objectives, and it is in this context that the EU developed a governance process which integrates both fiscal, economic, employment and social policies and which also necessitates the development of a monitoring framework on social issues. So, how is poverty and social exclusion perceived and measured in the EU? There is already a long time a politically endorsed definition of poverty. Way back in 1973, the European Council defined poverty as so, and I quote this definition. So, people are said to be living in poverty if their income and resources are so inadequate as to preclude them from having a standard of living considered acceptable in the society in which they live. This definition has guided since then the way poverty and social exclusion is perceived in the EU. It is important to stress its main components. It looks at income in relation to the living standards of the country in which a person lives. So this can differ between member states. Or in other words, poverty is conceived in the EU as relative poverty. While the EU financed some research projects and data collections to measure poverty in the 1980s and 90s, it was only in 2000, with its midterm strategy for the period until 2010, the so called Lisbon strategy, that the EU adopted a set of common soci social objectives. 
in the fields of social exclusion, pensions and health and long-term care. It was also at this moment that the EU member states, together with the European Commission, set up a monitoring framework and agreed on an operational definition of poverty. And so, as you can see on the slide, poverty was defined as the number or percentage of persons that lives in a household whose income is below the poverty threshold. And this poverty threshold was set at 60% of median equivalent disposable household income, with an equivalent scale of 1 for the first adult, 0 0.5 for every following adult in the household, and 0 0.3 for every child in the household uh, below the age of 14. This indicator, thus defined, has been called the at-risk of poverty rate. A next step happened at the occasion of the successor strategy of the Lisbon strategy, the so-called Europe 2020 strategy. In the context of this new strategy, member states agreed to set a number of targets to be reached by 2020 next to an employment target, an education target, a target on green, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, a target on investment in research and development. A target was set on the reduction of poverty and social exclusion and this target uh, was politically adopted in 2010. To allow different policy choices of member states to contribute to reaching the poverty target, the target was based on a combination of three indicators. And you can see them on the following slides. I'll briefly go over them. So the first indicator which, which served as a basis for uh, this target was the at risk of poverty rate which I already explained. So the number of persons living in a household whose income is below the poverty threshold. A second indicator which served as a basis for the target was quasi-jobless households. This is the number of persons living in a household in which the adult household members work less than 20% of their potential working time. So this concerns an indicator which measures the attachment of the household to the labour market. Then, a third indicator which served as a basis for the target was the severe material deprivation indicator. This measures the number of persons living in a household that cannot afford at least four of nine items. And you can see them on the screen to pay for rent, mortgage, utilities, keep the home adequately warm, face unexpected expenses, eat meat or proteins uh, regularly, to go on holiday, a television set, a washing machine, a car, a telephone. So if a person lives in a household uh, which lacks f at least four of these nine items, the person is considered to be living in a situation of severe material deprivation. The agreed target consisted of reducing the number of persons in the EU that were at risk of poverty and or living in a quasi-jobless household and or uh, in a severely deprived household by 20 million. So this was the target to reduce the number of persons in, in a situation of poverty and social exclusion by 20 million, starting from a level of 120 million, million at the start of the strategy. This amounts to a reduction of about 17%. This concerns the target and the level of ambition at EU level. Next to this, member states were expected to set national targets and, and set a national ambition level in setting national targets, member states had the liberty to choose on which indicators their target would be based.
but they had to explain how their target was linked to the EU level target. The following slide gives a visual presentation of this combination of the three indicators on which the target is based for the whole of the EU. It shows that at EU level most people are poor or socially excluded because they are income poor, followed by people living in severely deprived households. People living in a quasi jobless household are the smallest group. In 2011, for which this graph applies, 8 million persons were living in a quasi jobless household with an income below the poverty line and which was also severely materially deprived. So these 8 million people combined a, a bad situation on these three indicators. This was the situation at EU level for the whole of the EU. However, the weight, so to say, of the different indicators in defining uh, the population at risk of poverty or social exclusion can differ significantly between member states, depending on the state of economic development of the member state, the functioning of the labour market, the income distribution and the adequacy of social protection. The following slide shows two examples of these differing situations. In Bulgaria, the biggest group are the severely materially deprived, while in Germany, the biggest group are the income poor. And so the situation differs, uh, varies uh, between the member states in different ways. While there has been some criticism, on this conceptualization of poverty and social exclusion, it does reflect different situations in member states and does allow to reflect different relevant policy approaches to tackle poverty and social exclusion. This was important to reach a political compromise and accept the use of a target which, after all, reflects a clear and rather visible commitment from policy makers. Now, meanwhile, we are in 2019 and you may ask yourself, where are you? Is the EU on track of reaching its target? The next slide gives an answer. In 2010, the timing to set a target was really not ideal due to the financial and economic crisis. And you can see that the total number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion rather increased than decreased, at least in the first instance. However, with improved labour market and economic conditions, it started to decrease again as from about 2013. First slowly, and in the more recent figures, stronger. In 2017, the total number was below the start data for the strategy, which was 2008, because these were the most recent available data at the start of the strategy in 2010. It is, however, also important to notice that there are differences in the evolution of the different constituent indicators. The drop in the total number is in the first place due to a drop in the number of people in a situation of severe material deprivation and to a lesser extent to a decreasing number of people in quasi jobless households. While the income poverty only shows a very modest decrease in the latest available figures after successive increases. It is very important to take account of these differences, of these different realities for policy purposes because they signal different policy issues. Now, I still have a lot of things to say, but not so much time anymore. So I will go rather briefly through my other points. To have indicators, data are needed. So back in 2000, together with agreeing on common social objectives, also a common data collection was agreed. This was the EU Statistics on Income and Living Conditions, EU SILC, 
which has become the main source of comparable data on income and living conditions in the EU. The EU SILC is executed by national statistical institutes and coordinated by Eurostat, the statistical office of the European Union. As you can see on the slide, sample sizes vary between member states from about 3,000 to 8,000 households, with a total uh, of about 130,000 households for the whole of the EU. I will go no further in the technical details here, but there is a lot of information available on the Eurostat website on the EU SILC. I have talked about the indicators of poverty or social exclusion in the target. However, a much broader set of indicators has been agreed by the member states to monitor the social situation. These are listed in the EU social indicators portfolio, which can also be found on the website of the indicators subgroup of the Social Protection Committee. It is relevant to understand that these indicators are not just a collection of statistics, but have been agreed upon by the Member States and the European Commission. Two features of this set of indicators I want to mention here, without going into the details. First, as Member States' social situation and progress in this field are assessed based on those indicators, it is clear that there need to be requirements regarding the quality of the indicators. Therefore, at the start, a number of quality criteria were agreed upon. You can see them on the slide. I will not go deeper into them, as they are quite self-evident. So it concerns statistical reliability, comparability, uh, etc. Agreeing on a set of indicators in a policy context requires some flexibility from the side of the member states. Not every indicator will always be of as good quality in all member states. And some indicators may not yet have already all the required quality uh, characteristics. While it is considered as an essential piece of information to be taken on board in the monitoring framework. Therefore, a framework of labeling the indicators has also been agreed upon. This gives an indication on how every indicator can be used. For instance, is it fit to be used in a comparative analysis or not? Or is it only useful or possible to assess the evolution over time within a member state. So this framework uh, of labeling the indicators consists of following classification, and you can see it on the slides. We uh, separate commonly agreed EU indicators, which are considered to be fit to compare member states, uh, and we separate them from commonly agreed national indicators, which are only fit to monitor the situation over time within a member state. So they are not, these uh, type of indicators are not yet fit to be uh, compared between member states. Next to these two types of indicators, EU indicators and national indicators, we also separate uh, context information, which is not directly linked to the policy issue we want to monitor, but which provides uh, the broader context in which uh, these indicators are to be interpreted. Next to this classification, we also uh, distinguish the indicators uh, between primary indicators and secondary indicators. Primary indicators being the main indicators capturing uh, the phenomenon we want to measure in first instance and the secondary indicators are more in support of the primary indicators. So there is some flexibility uh, to integrate indicators in the monitoring uh, framework, in the, in the indicators portfolio, and give them a place in this classification based on EU indicators, national indicators, primary indicators, secondary indicators. Uh, this allows some flexibility uh, and indicates 
the way that the indicators can be used in the monitoring analysis. And this, this, uh, this framework has proven to be very useful to integrate and to agree on indicators to be integrated uh, in the monitoring framework. So I've talked about the data, I have talked about the indicators, but to assess and communicate the main messages from the indicators to the policy makers, specific monitoring tools were developed. I show, uh, for example, here the Social Protection Performance Monitor, which consists of a dashboard of about 20 key social indicators, which, comes from the, which come from the broader list, and indicates for which indicators a positive and negative evolution has been found. On the basis of this dashboard of key social indicators, the number of countries with a positive or negative trend on an indicator are counted. And this indicates the main positive and negative trends in the EU. So this is a means, a tool, to communicate and make visible uh, the main messages coming from the indicators. So, and overall, together with the target, this has proven to be a powerful tool to make social trends more visible in the policy debate. Then, finally, how is all this information used in the EU governance? Very briefly, it is used for, for mutual learning uh, purposes. It is used to assess uh, progress towards the common uh, objectives the member states have set and it is used as the evidence base for uh, issuing country-specific recommendations from the EU level to the member states. So these are the main uh, objectives of this monitoring framework. And with this I have come to the end of my presentation. I hope it was not too much for you to digest and with the support of technology I will be happy to join you for the discussion and try to answer questions you may have. Thank you very much for your attention.